Hello, everybody. Welcome to the live stream. Glad to have you here. We're going to kick off the show. It's awesome to have you here. Hello and welcome to Python Bytes, where we deliver Python news and headlines directly to your earbuds. This is episode 267, recorded January 19th, 2020, 2022. That's it. I'm Brian Aachen. I'm Michael Kennedy. And uh, we've got... Um, I've got kind of a, I've got a cool green screen today. Uh, oh my God. I, I know some days we have cool stuff to talk about and cool things to share, but you're taking the next level. You are uh, live streaming and recording yep. right from the beach in Hawaii. So uh, yeah, I'm looking I'm out at so surfers right now. So it's nice. It's, you could probably handle doing it more than one week, right? You could just do this for a while. Yeah, we, we should, I should move here about a month every year. That'd be great. Yeah. But indeed. anyway. Uh, let's move on to our topics. Uh, Michael, you want to talk about boxes? I, you know, I, I really do want to talk about boxes. This is such a, a cool library that I found and I don't remember where I saw it. I think I just discovered, I don't think this was sent in by a guest. So here's the thing. We have Python classes and we have dictionaries. Where's all the data stored for most classes? in the dunder dict right which is a dictionary of what is your field here's its value each instance of the class each object gets its own instance of that dictionary right yeah and yet when we have a dictionary we can't treat it we can't get the values of the dictionary in the same way that we do of a class a class you say thing dot field well wouldn't it be nice if you could go to your dictionary and say it has a key dot name so just d dot name and access yeah. it. That's the basic idea behind this thing called Box by C.D. Griffith. And that enough, that was enough to get me interested and, and think, all right, this is a cool idea that I would love to play with and maybe I should use it more. But then I started to look a little bit further. So if you go down here, it says, all right, well, sometimes these keys, they have a, a structure that won't allow you to treat them that way, like a space or a colon in the example of spaces and colon. Yeah. So for example, they have a key that is the name of a movie and then data about that movie. So Robin Hood spaces, colon men in tights with spaces. And by default, it'll actually convert that into <laughs> something that you can use by just you know replacing spaces with underscores and colons just go away and stuff like that. Oh, so that's awesome. You can still do that, which is cool. But there's a lot more stuff. It says, check out the box GitHub wiki, which is right on the homepage, the GitHub that I link to. And there's all sorts of things. So they show start by showing just the basic stuff. Like here's a box and you just, you can create it through keyword values or pass it a dictionary. It'll initialize out of that. So they've got like funny movie equals something. And you just say my box dot funny movie, just like it was a class. And that was like I described the first thing. However, there's more that you can do with it. So if you go over to the types of boxes, they have conversion box, default boxes, box dots, <laughs> camel killer box, which is awesome. <laughs> Frozen boxes, converters. So not just only will it work in all these ways, which I'm about to describe, it will convert to and from dictionaries, to and from JSON, to and from YAML, to and from Ooh. message pack and CSV. Oh. Okay, so let's go to the types of boxes and check this out. So by default, you get the conversion box, which is what I described where there's a space. It'll put an underscore. Yeah. All of them you can access in this key value way. It's just a matter of what happens to the keys if there's a way to make them more accessible. But you can turn that off. You can have, you know, a default dictionary, right? Where if the thing is not there instead of throwing a key error it'll create whatever you say the default is like create a list because i want to add up things or create start with the number zero because we're trying to count each one of those as we build it up or something like that right so it can also be a default dictionary they call that a default box which is cool and it can also do what it calls uh box dots so in a string you can traverse the the hierarchy of the stuff contained in the box through the dot notation. So you could say, you know, my box dot a dot b dot c, and it has this fluent interface where the thing that it returns from each level is either a primitive thing like a number, but if it's a, a sub dictionary, it'll return a, a sub box, I guess, right? So you can keep going on it. You can also then just say quote a dot b dot c, 
to traverse that hierarchy as a string if that's more programmable. This one is great. Are you working against an API or some data source that is written in a different language style? So especially I'm thinking C Sharp here where it's not lowercase and underscores as a separator, but it's capitalization, camel case. Like they, the example they have is pesky and annoying keys, which is capital P, capital A, capital A, capital K, all one thing. And like, if you're going to say dot the thing, well, guess what? You're going to have to write that in your code, right? Yeah. Unless you make it a camel killer box and then it converts it to snake case, pesky underscore and underscore and annoying and keys. So if you program against an API that's written in another language, you can still do this Pythonic code, which is, that's amazing, right? Yeah, I like that. That's great. <laughs> I know, it's a good uh, a good name. Uh, frozen I mean, box. I, yeah. I, I wouldn't, it's it's a fun thing. I personally wouldn't recommend it because then your code, you're, it's hard to look up the documentation because it'll be wrong, things yeah. like that. Yeah, maybe something more in the affirmative like, snake case converted or i don't know whatever yeah. um they have a frozen box so it's unmutable and hashable which is pretty cool yeah. uh, uh, um, a recast so you if you put in strings to this key and that you want it to be numbers it'll always convert it to a float or whatever um so those are all uh, pretty awesome and then it'll even do things like put a prefix for stuff that couldn't be valid non-quoted symbols right you could you can say dot name but you can't say dot 327 name right so yeah. you can say put an x so it's x 317 or whatever uh, all those things are pretty awesome uh let's let me go back here the other thing is just the converters right so there's all the converters you might so two dictionary two yaml two toml and also from all those things which i think is pretty neat so what do you think like it yeah, I do. And there's there's times where I've really had a, wanted to conveniently just create something with a dictionary, but I wanted to use dot notation. So I've used like a name tuple or something like that. Right. And um, and this this is actually this does it for you. So nice. It's really nice. And I've done stuff like that as well, where I'm like, all right, I'm going to create an own class. It derives from dictionary and just give it a set adder, get adder. So you can do the dot thing on it. But this seems to have just so many more other features on top of it that I don't think I'll ever do that again. I'm just going to use this box thing. It seems so yeah. much better. Nice. That's yeah. Cool. So I think there's just a few comments that I, I got to bring in. Uh, yeah. Roman Wright other points out that the setting default box is not the default setting, which is pretty <laughs> awesome. <laughs> yeah. Chris May points out that that for this, someone uh, needs to think outside this package to get something <laughs> outside the box, right? Out to, yeah. to get something really amazing. And uh, uh, just, you know, Brandon Brainer is a little bit jealous of your green screen. <laughs> hey, that Brandon was the one I had I had on a, as a guest for um, testing code recently. So, oh, Hi, Brandon. Right on. Yeah, very cool. So, all right. Um, what's, well, what's next? what's next is a uh, mocking, sort of mocking. So Adam Johnson has an article called uh, "Making Simple Mocks with Simple Making Simple Mocks with Simple Namespace," and I had never heard of this, so I'm really glad he wrote this article. It's really pretty great. Um, oh, do I have the wrong? Oh, yeah, let's just cover this one. I need my notes. Never mind. Um, so Adam's actually been crushing it lately. He's got a lot of recent blog, blog posts. So good job, Adam. Um, the, uh, the simple namespace is pretty neat. It comes from the type standard library. So it's not an extra package you have to have to bring in, uh, which that's cool. But one of the things, so it, it's like, normally we use unit test mock, um, or you can to mock something. But one of the problems with mocks is by default, if you misspell something, it's going to be fine. It mock just lets you do whatever attribute access you want. And that's usually not something you want. Right. So, usually the mock is like, let me just get in the way and just <laughs> let things keep working no matter what. Right. And just don't yeah. do anything unless you say return this value for this function call or something. Right. You can pass in specs. Um, and, and if you have a known object that you're mocking, you use specs and that, that works. But it, sometimes you don't need that much of stuff. So simple namespace is a thing that just lets you fill in attributes. And then it works to access them. It works kind of like a name tuple or something like that. But the usage of it is super simple. And then, and then you can pass this around 
And so in the in the parlance of uh, of like testing, this would be for a fake or a stub, uh, not really a mock because you don't interrogate it. But if you just need to fill it, have something that that, uh, you know, walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, you can use one of these to create a duck um, and have it get passed in. It's pretty cool and super simple and really easy. Yeah, Love it. it seems a lot like just what people would have expected mocks to do if you described it. <laughs> yeah, um, like it. So uh, when he has a is a great quote. It's as simple as possible with no faff around being callable or tracking usage or something. So um, in in a lot of sometimes with mocks, you uh, try to interrogate. So you have a function call and you interrogate the mocks to say, did it get called by my code? These don't do that. You can't do that. But it, it as long as but you set it up with the attributes you want, pass it through. Um, and it's pretty just pretty neat. I'm going to use these all the time now. So. Yeah, it looks fantastic. Very nice find. All right. For the next one that I want to talk about, let's go to space space and embedded things in space so this is pretty fun um this is an article on zdnet talking about uh raspberry pi so apparently the european space agency has uploaded and installed and configured two new raspberry pies and not just any raspberry pies there are these um is it astro pi that's what it is these are um, regular uh, Raspberry Pi 4 boards, Model Bs, with 8 gigs of memory that have been hardened for space. <laughs> okay. Wow. Okay. And the whole goal of having them up here is so that students and kids can write code and run experiments and just play with automation, but literally using the sensors of the International Space Station and actually writing Python code and machine learning stuff that runs up there in space. Isn't that cool? That's incredible. Yeah, yeah. So apparently there's 500 student programming teams in Europe who are all participating in this thing called the European Astro Pi Challenge, which is like an education-focused uh, competition or, or startup or whatever. Okay. Yeah. So cool. Out of this world. It's out of this world, absolutely. <laughs> it's really cool to see Python in space, right? And uh, here's just more of it, right? So And Raspberry Pis. I know because you can you can practice your stuff at home and then have it go up there. Neat. Yeah, very cool. So you have things like the humidity reading and board the ISS and uh, the various sensors and, and things on there that you can work with and then just do sciencey things. I mean, when I was a kid, I, the science fair was like, well, let's make a little volcano that erupts and like oozes stuff out of paper mache. And, you know, these kids get to write code that runs in space. That's that's next level. Yeah, I admit that I've never done the volcano thing, though. I kind of I should do that. Yeah, I haven't either very much. I mean, <laughs> I did some paper mache thing and I think I had a failed volcano once, but <laughs> that's about it. Anyway, I just think this is really cool and it's a, a neat use of of Raspberry Pis, it's a, w a cool way to take like a semi-modern computing environment, put it somewhere neat where it has access to real the real world, and let kids and other researchers write code on it without going, yeah, we're not going to install your program on the ISS. No, no thanks to that. <laughs> this is so neat. I'm I'm this blown away. I would have never thought that something like this was going to happen in my lifetime. It's nice. Yeah, yeah. So many neat things. All right. Well, that's that's all I got to say about that. But definitely fun. Um. So uh, one of the things that new new coders have to deal with, it, and unfortunately it's, it's hard to t tell them ahead of time how to deal with it, is tracebacks. So tracebacks are um, uh, uh, they're just part of life with uh, coding. And Trey Hunter has an article called Reading Tracebacks in Python. And it's a really great, simple introduction. I love it. Um, one of the things I want to comment on is um, just just the, the order in which we teach people things and it teaching people how to do tracebacks is something that it really needs to be early, maybe like right before testing <laughs> and right after the <laughs> hello world. Um, but trace seriously, tracebacks happen so fast. And, and when you start coding, uh, an assertion happens that you don't catch and you get a traceback and people panic and go, Oh my God, I suck as a programmer. And you don't, it's not overwhelming. Just kind of walk through it simply. And that's what this article is about is how to walk through it simply. And so we're going to, uh, it's 
if it, if people are new to Python listening to this or how to teach people, you just teach people to start at the bottom. You read the last line first. So the last line in a traceback is the uh, error message. Let's uh, scroll to one on here. Which is good so, to know because that's not true for other programming languages. The error is at the top and it, it's kind of inverted. Oh, really? Yeah. I, I, I forget. But yeah. So the last line is the the exception and then and then also the message for the exception if it's if it's there and then and then you read up and the the next two lines up are um you've got a, a file name and a line number and and then a copy of what the line is um and if and that's it that's the place where the exception actually happened and these two double things these two lines the line is called um uh what do you call it they're the uh stack trace the stack whatever yeah. call, call uh, stack yeah it's this is the call stack um the, and even that's more so because you get lines within functions right not just the yeah. yeah yeah and then uh um and then if you don't understand why you have an exception there you just keep going up you keep going up to and sometimes the the, the exception happened not in your code but in some fun, some third library call that you went called so you're not going to debug that so you have to debug your your code so you it's good to go up enough to where it's in your code. And then if you can't figure it out, you just keep going up. Um, and this, this example is actually not obvious to me what was going on. So I'm glad he walks through it. So Trey walks through how to read this and goes up to um, the fact that, so this is the, the, the example has a type error because you can't concatenate a string to an integer. Um, and that's weird because it doesn't look like it's trying to do that. But, uh, but then he walks up to find out that the the function is actually taking the standard input um, and passing it in as a number and one of the arg v's and you have to convert it to an int first. But so that's a that's some, I'm glad he used that example because people new to command line interface uh, coding often forget that that the input is usually a string, even though if you pass in a five, it's still going to be a string with a five in it. Uh, right. It looks the, like a number, but it's not yeah, a number. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So you have to convert those. Um, and a reminder here: this is user input. Even in uh, so, in this case, it's not going to be harmful just to convert it to an int. But uh, even command line in, in input is input from a user, so you have to sanitize it if you need if you're doing anything like with a database or something. So absolutely. Oh, uh, that's that's great. I think definitely that's the kind of thing you need to start with when you're teaching people Python, like almost before you teach them to code, like how to, if you run into an error, here's how you understand it a little bit. And here's how you Google it or, or go about finding some way to fix it. Yeah. And if you start, especially if you start at the top, it's going to be a mess. Cause if you've got a call stack, like 50 functions deep, hopefully not, it's going to be a really big traceback and you don't want to try to untangle all of it. Just start at the bottom. Yeah, so. absolutely. And you know, Dean out in the live stream says, you know, when you use some Python wrapper on top of a Java microservice and you get a 500 line exception, you're <laughs> like, what have I done wrong to deserve this? Yeah, that's like the advanced version of this. Yeah. Speaking yeah. of advanced, how about some intrigue? Ooh, mm -hmm. Ooh nice picture. Yes. So you and the listeners may have heard of this person who turned out to go a little bit bonkers on their open source code, luckily in NPM and not Python, so Java, uh, JavaScript space. So there's colors and JS, which are two widely used no padding margin NPM libraries used for JavaScript and Node.js. Well, this uh, developer, Marak Squires, in, first they thought it was a supply chain vulnerability and somebody hacked the account, but it turns out, no, 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 Marek intentionally corrupted both of his libraries so they ran in an in, in endless loop spitting out random political messages <laughs> while it would loop around and just fill the screen with garbage so initially thought to be a hack but uh political and personal messages included in the code and on his related websites indicate that it may be the work of a disgruntled lashing out <laughs> developer wacky wacky okay so that's not i was not going to cover that i saw that and i thought that that was Pretty interesting. And then uh, Mike LaFontaine points out, oh, uh, Brian Krebs, the security guy, 
I just noticed that this Marek Squires seems to be the same fellow who sab sabotaged two of his own popular open source libraries the next week. And he links to an article on in my post, residents of Queen <laughs> home with suspected bomb making materials charged for um, some sort of like terrorism um, type of thing. So the same person who sabotaged their um, their NPM packages then was like in the process of making bombs. And it just kind of shows you the, <laughs> an interesting spectrum of where all this stuff lands. That's crazy, huh? Uh, yeah. Weird. Yeah. yeah, very weird. Oh, I also forgot to point out, this is uh, an extra, extra, extra section. So mm. short. I got I got more stuff. But the first one is, the guy that went and messed up all the stuff on NPM and everybody's dependencies recently uh, has now been charged with creating bombs in Queens, New York. So, <laughs> yeah, there's that. Okay. Here, here's one that's really positive. Andy Griffiths, uh, don't know this person, but they posted something incredibly simple that is super helpful when you're building websites and trying to design them. You know, you can go to inspect element and you can like hover over different parts of your page and highlight and it'll show, okay, this is actually the div here that is containing this and it has a margin. And so that's why it looks like that. Yeah. This guy posted, hey, struggling with layout, turn on CSS outlines. It's a superpower. And all you have to do is write this incredibly simple CSS. Star is the CSS selector, outline colon one PX solid red. And what you get is your entire site now highlights all the elements on the page so you can figure out how to style them and how oh, that's pretty cool given the amount of work <laughs> isn't that amazing yeah yeah, yeah. So, so i definitely think this is something i'm going to try to use when i'm working on uh design and stuff because it's just so e so much easier than trying to like hunt around with like the de debug tools and then you know you reload the page and it changes and all that so quick tip for people there who do web stuff Python 3.10.2 is out, and there's actually a decent amount of stuff shipped in it. Uh, if I do some quick scrolly scrolly, I would say that's like 30, 40 changes and bug fixes and so on. Wow. So things like fix hang in run test underscore MP due to race condition, or fix this thing in documentation, or um, fixed hash lib used for security option to work correctly with the new version of OpenSSL. Uh, fix memory leak in pyeval.evalcodex. That sounds like it might be used a lot of places. And used in the conjunction with the word memory leak, <laughs> that might be good to fix. Anyway, I already installed this on all of my servers and have it running in production, and it nothing seemed to catch fire, so that's good. Yeah, very good. Yeah, hmm. so uh, Python 3.10.2 is out. That's cool. Whew, all right. Uh, one, I think one more thing. Two more, two more things. <laughs> Related, I'm doing a YouTube series on a bunch of little short Python lessons, and I've got about 100 videos I want to make, and I've made five of them and published or scheduled them to go out already. So uh, I've got a list. Don't show me this thing. Anyway, a um, bunch of little tips like parsing data with Pydantic or counting the number of occurrences of items in a list, or you've got four in loops, convert them to list comprehensions. These are all like four minute videos that just teach you something really quick in Python. So if people are interested in that, they can click the link and then subscribe to my personal channel, not the Python Bytes YouTube channel, which is awesome, but doesn't have this content uh, to get more of those. So nice. that, that's fun. Cool. And how, do you, cool. You, you, how do you find time for all this stuff, Michael? You're like <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> Anyway. I've been I've been wanting to do some of these YouTube videos and just try and explore some of the ways in which people are like presenting and teaching coding for like six months. And I've just decided I'm just going to take some days and just going to do it because uh, I've been putting off for like months. So there's that. Speaking of time, I also um, am controlling our stream and doing all sorts of fun stuff with like this device called a stream deck, which you may have heard of. So yeah. the stream deck. You have one too, right? But it's not in Hawaii. <laughs> Dream Deck is this little device here that um, lets you basically set up a bunch of buttons and control things, which is super fun. And it's built for streamers and whatnot. I decided to see what you could do if, um, let's see. Uh, 
pulled up the wrong link. I decided to see what you could do around um, the Stream Deck and software development. So, so far I have two profiles, one for PyCharm where you can control all sorts of things like click a button on your little device and it'll show your PRs or switch the select modes you can write and call multi-columns and all sorts of stuff. And then also one for Jupyter that'll like launch Jupyter and insert, insert your standard imports and add cells above and below and rerun them or show me the command palette and stuff. Neat. So yeah, that also has a, a video uh, on it as well. And people can check that out. But I, I've got this YouTube profile, uh, not YouTube, uh, GitHub profile um, repository where it has all the profiles for uh, the Stream Deck. So if people want to download it, play with it, customize it, those are up there as well. All right, that's it for all of my extras. You got any yourself? Um, yeah, so I wanted to talk about, um, so this is a, a cool article by David Amos. Uh, so David's awesome. He's one of the one of the gang, the people at RealPython. But um, it's, the article's are three things you might not know about numbers in, <laughs> in Python. And uh, one of the, I don't know where the line is. Oh, it's near the top. It's so awesome. He's got a, a line that says, um, uh, <laughs> there's a good chance that you've used a number in one of your programs. Yeah, I, I think this so. Is, I, I, would, I could get behind that statement. <laughs> Yeah. So one of the things that like strings have uh, strings have fun like functions attached to them. They've got methods. Um, and, I, you know, we know that it's, it's kind of different than other languages, but numbers do, too. And um, this is something actually I didn't didn't occur to me that uh, that you can do like two bytes and stuff. So there's there's functions that you can call on a number. There's a trick, though. You can't do like 255 dot two bytes you have to put it in a variable name so that it doesn't think it's a decimal point um and you also or you can put parentheses around it so you can do 255 with parentheses around it and then call uh two bytes or something like that so there's uh integers have two bytes uh, so you can convert it to bytes you can use the class uh class method from bytes and you can also th do like bit length and uh, a bunch of other functions that are pretty cool around integers which is neat and then floats have their own methods floats have uh like uh is an integer or is integer ratio which or as integer ratio so it'll convert it to an integer ratio that's pretty cool oh wow um, like a some sort of approximation in, in rational numbers like yeah so um um yeah i don't have i don't have that example pulled up no but that's cool there's some i'm I no there, idea I'm, about this stuff yeah, I've got a bunch. There's a, there's a. There'll be some links in the show notes to the uh, the Python documentation for these. Um, it's pretty nice. Uh, the the other, okay. So that's the first thing that you should know about numbers is there's methods there. So look them up in the documentation, um, and I'll we'll have links to the documentation. And then the second thing you should know about numbers, second over the third, is numbers have hierarchy. So um, there's uh, there's four four abstract types in uh, in python for numbers there's complex real rational and in integral so complex is the complex that most of them only have one type in it complex the uh, uh abstract type of complex has complex real has float rational has fraction but integral has both int and bool so that's neat um their bool and ints are related and then but then we also have these uh uh decimals um yeah so there's i wanted to find his stuff on decimal decimals don't fit so decimals have their they're not really part of this hierarchy at all but they're they're their own decimal class so there's not uh there's not an abstract class but that's okay decimals are great and people should remember decimal is around if you have um if you're working with money or something like that you or super definitely... precise science um yeah. so these are good uh also uh because these are just normal types um numbers are extensible oh yeah a comment about floats are weird yeah it's, um floats are always weird on computers floats are weird yeah the numbers are extensible since these are cla classes you can it, you can derive from them uh but he comments which is good you have to be really careful because if you uh want to extend a class there's a whole bunch of dunder methods that you have to make sure work right so 
maybe you don't want to extend it, but you can. You can make your own numeric types. So it's just the third thing. Anyway, kind of a neat. Trying to wonder about. what you might actually create those for. I mean, maybe you <laughs> might. Well, maybe you will create an integer that has a bounds and is an error if you try to make one too large or something. Yeah, I I'm, I'm not sure. I, I'm thinking cases. on the spot here. Yeah. yeah. Uh, another thing that's amazing is a complex numbers are natively built into Python. Yeah, uh, and that's that's really great. And that's essential for a lot of scientific and uh, and you know measurement work and stuff is to have yeah. complex numbers around. They're, they're so. truly amazing. All right. Well, I think that's all. I mean, I already did my extras. I, I skipped your set here, your article. So I ask you about your extras. Do you have any actual extras you want to cover? I don't have any actual extras. Have you had no. any dangerous encounters with like warm water? Have you maybe stubbed your toe on a rock or was there a, a turtle that came by or I mean, you well, could so run into or like an eel. There are eels in, the, <laughs> in the, the reefs there that you might want to stay with. So I've, I've only been here a couple of days so far. We've been, I've been swimming a couple of times right out, right? Like you can, uh, you have to look down, not across to see the beach from, from where I'm staying. Um, and so I went swimming right here. Uh, it's got, it's kind of fun because it drops off right away. So there's a little beach and then it drops, it drops deeper right away. And that's, but it's not like a big current. So you can swim really with only going out a few feet, which is nice. And then we went to another beach that was like shallow for a long time, but then had coral and stuff. And that was really fun to scuba dive or to not scuba, but uh, snorkel over uh, and look around. But if you're just wanting to walk out, <laughs> that coral's like tough to walk on oh, yeah, and, uh, yeah, and yeah, hurts. Yeah. So, yeah, that stuff's yeah. super sharp, but yeah. beautiful. But having having a lot of fun. Awesome. Good to hear. Well, I think we should round it out with uh, one or two things here. We got uh, some jokes. Now, I saw Josh out in the audience, and he sent in some jokes, which we'll make part of this soon, but uh, I didn't have time for this episode. So we got four O'Reilly book covers. <laughs> I love these. Not the O'Reilly, because, you know, the O'Reilly books, they always have an animal and a title yeah. and whatnot. So O'Reilly art takes that and kind of uh, puts a funny spin on it. Um, I'll do this first one. We got 40. Maybe we could do two each. So the first one here has a platypus on the screen. It says the little subtitle is or the, the quote is the original developer isn't here for a reason. And the title is losing your will to live a code maintenance guide. <laughs> yes. Written, written by In the, there. written by the intern. The intern. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Well, you want to take this one? Um, so the, uh, the title is uh, Expert Vague Understanding of Computer Science. Probably be able to explain a sorting algorithm if it ever comes up. Uh, by it. the practical dev? I don't yeah, know. by the practical dev. Very good. Very good. Okay. Yeah. The next one is an elephant. Very proud, speaking out loudly. It, says, it depends. The definitive guide. The answer to every programming question ever conceived. <laughs> It's a short book. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> All right. Uh, bring it, bring us home with this last one. Okay. So uh, works on my machine. Uh, the definitive guide, how to convince your manager. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> very good. Very good. Well, Brian, everyone listening, almost everyone is jealous. I'm sure there's some people in Hawaii like, yeah, that, I just go there every day, but most other people are probably jealous uh, where you get to, to record from today. So thanks yeah. for making the time. Thank you. Um, it's fun. Always fun to be here with the uh, Python Bytes people. Yeah, so. absolutely. Hey, uh, before we end the stream, the people in the audience are asking if you can turn around your camera. Is that possible or will it disconnect do, do you? Do what? Turn, turn the turn, camera? They want to see your view. Oh, yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> Dude, that makes it worse. That doesn't make it better. Yeah. Yeah, that's so, awesome. And we picked up Lay's, of course. First time course. to Hawaii. Had to. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, thanks again for taking the time and thanks for everyone for being here. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Bye.